Hello, everyone. Welcome back to another episode of the Geek Warning Podcast brought to you by the Escape Collective, your one-stop shop for everything you need to know this week in the world of bicycle tech. Coming up on today's show, we're going to talk about Shimano's I think continued dominance, we could say, in the value segment of the bicycle component market. Uh, we're going to talk about Campagnolo's long-awaited in-house power meter. There's a really interesting wheel trade-in program that we found out about from Logos. Some interesting high-stakes drama in the C-suite at Scott Sports. Uh, we're also going to talk about some little bits of news from Envy, Vittoria, Rene Hurst, Goreware, and Robert Axel. Uh, joining me to chat about all this is Escape Collective senior tech editor Dave Rome. Ronan's over in Belgium right now, digging around the team pit areas for race tech around the spring classics. So, so stay tuned for some more in-depth written and audio coverage from him. Uh, Dave, your hair James. in the morning is looking wonderful as always. Thank you. Uh, Thank you. <laughs> you uh, Inspired you recently... by my dog. <laughs> Fantastic. Yes. Yeah. Um, you, you recently published in your latest threaded newsletters uh, a few thoughts I guess you could say, on uh, T47 threaded bottom brackets. What did you have on your mind there? Oh, I thought you were going to ask me about uh, SRAM's new chain wax. But uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, the, t the threaded article is mainly about my frustrations with uh, internal style T47, which places the bearings inside the bottom bracket shell and therefore has uh, the external flange is basically the same width as an old press fit cup, which doesn't leave a lot of... Uh, engagement with a tool to thread in and torque a cup to 40 ish newton meters so that's basically where the article came from and and why it existed and uh add in that there's many many different fitment styles for what seems like the same bottom bracket cup because uh a lot of brands design their own at a similar time frame without talking to each other uh and yeah there's there's some frustrations there it's a it's half rant half useful article so i would recommend everyone check it out for the times that they may or may not work with such a bottom bracket is there going to be a follow-up article on how to remove a seized internal type t47 cup after you know the threads are totally stuck and all the splines have ripped out uh i i feel like no one will want that answer which is, <laughs> uh, it's not pretty. It, it often involves collapsing the cup with, a, yeah, some kind of uh, cutting instrument. It's so, a very, very, very careful use of a hacksaw. Yeah. The nice thing with T47 is it's bigger, so you can get a, a cutting tool in there more easily versus a, a BSA bottom bracket. But, uh, yeah, thankfully, I've never actually personally had to do that because, I yeah, I think with, the right tools and the right uh, retention systems to stop the tool from slipping, you have a pretty good chance of applying some significant torque to it. Uh, but I know others have not been so fortunate. So, um, yeah. Anyway, dare I say <laughs> that, uh, yeah, T47 is not the, it's not the, the silver bullet for bottom brackets. Yeah, I have to say, I mean, having followed the development of T47 since its, its, uh, its inception with, it's what was a Chris King and White Industries, uh, an I think in Argonaut, and in Argonaut, however many years ago yeah. now. Yep. Um, I still like the idea of T forty seven. Yep. I think it still has a lot going on mm -hmm. going on with it, and it just seems like yet again, like the application or I guess the execution of it just isn't quite what we really want it to be. Yeah. Um, I've been thinking a lot more about this sort of like theory versus execution thing because uh, as most regular readers of uh, of Escape Collective and certainly listeners of Geek Warning know, I've got this framework frame in for review that I'm just finishing up hopefully this week. Um, and that has bearings that press directly into a machined bottom bracket shell and actually into the machined head tube too. Mm -hmm. um, and I have to say, like it, it really has kind of changed a lot of my views on press fit because, yes, the bearings still press into the frame, and it's like you don't just you know unthread a cup or whatever. But it's such a good example of how good something can be when the execution is dead on. Because yeah. it that frame was legitimately one of the absolute easiest bikes I've ever built up because everything went together exactly how it was supposed to. Mm. And that bottom bracket spins so smoothly, even just with regular enduro bearing, uh, enduro stainless steel cartridges. It's it's pretty remarkable. 
because I, I mean, just knowing how he how he builds those, or knowing how he machines those those lugs, uh, it, it's remarkable how good bearings can be when the bores are where they're supposed to be in space. Mm. It's almost like press fit in theory was wasn't a bad thing. It's just I mean, it it never was a bad roughly thing in theory, just roughly approximating uh, a bore size and not caring whether it aligns left or right turned out to mm-hmm. be a bad thing. Ah. Uh, so frustrating. Anyway, no point in relitigating the past here. Uh, mm. Let's go ahead and get into the news, huh? So, um, all right. So first up, th- this may or may not be super interesting to people with higher end or or even mid range tastes. Uh, but Shimano just recently announced a new entry level range of flat bar components called ESSA. Uh, that's it's aimed at mountain bike, fitness, and city bikes. Basically, just flat bars, um, and it consists. I mean, there's not, it's not like it's a whole group set or anything because there's basically just a rear derailleur, a crank, and a cassette. And it's designed to, quote, elevate Shimano's existing eight-speed lineup, unquote. Mm. So in other words, it's compatible with the, exist, uh, with the existing Altus, Acera, and Turney stuff, but it's basically just going to be nicer. Um, so also new from Shimano, we've got some short-reach flat bar shifter and a brake lever for its 9, 10, 11-speed Q's component range that's designed for riders with smaller hands. Uh, brake lever is pretty straightforward. It's basically just a different bend to the lever. Um, and the shifter, however, is interesting because it switches from a index finger operated trigger to uh, like a push push design. Uh, and then uh, those levers are repositioned, so they're they're now both quite a bit closer to the bar. So Shimano didn't announce any pricing or weights here, which isn't all that surprising considering this is basically just going to be all OEM I have some stuff. Pricing. Oh, you do have pricing. Mm. It's, is it very, very attainable? It's very attainable. It's it's very obvious that Shimano are taking the threat of Tektro and Microshift seriously with this. Uh, As they should. Yeah. Um, $160 US for a drivetrain in the ESSA. So that's like cassette, crank, shifter, derailleur, chain. That is awesome. <laughs> yeah. Um. Coming back to why I find this so interesting, though, I mean, for one, I think it's pretty intriguing that Shimano bothered to announce this stuff at all, considering we don't usually get press releases on kind of entry-level stuff from anybody. Um, But the idea that Shimano is calling attention to it really does kind of call into my head the idea that in this segment of the market, Shimano still continues to dominate. And as you Mm -hmm. mentioned, with kind of incursions from... Tektro and Microshift and other li- smaller brands like that, they really do think it's important to continue to maintain its position there. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And and yeah, I think uh, bottom bottom line, bottom dollar to Shimano. I mean, this is you know low value components, but probably you know when you're talking about the scale that these are produced in, it's it's probably a pretty important part to its business. So, uh, I'm not. <sighs> So it's not that I'm not surprised by this, but I think I'm I'm happy to see it. And I think for me, it answers a lot of questions around what we saw with Qs, which Qs was meant to be like the whole be all and end all entry level group set, but it was actually kind of a little high end. And for me, it it left some questions around like how is Shimano going to continue to service decades of eight speed bikes in the market already? Like you know, millions and millions of bikes that Qs look to ignore. And the cross compatibility of this new ESSA stuff with you know old eight speed or pre existing eight speed stuff is is nice to see. Um, yes, there's no front derailers here. This is actually a one by only offering. Uh, so yeah, cranks, which front I think derailers, is smart. Left shift is a problem, but yeah, it 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 makes that eight speed stuff more relevant to a market today. So um, yeah, I guess the the main thing to know here is uh, it's it's based around a single cassette size. So it's an eleven to forty five tooth cassette. Uh, and that's James. You're looking confused. Is it an 1145 or an 1142? 45. Okay. Yeah, and then uh, it's it gives me real old Mega Range vibes because it, the the next cassette, the next cog down from the 45 is the 35. So you get a nice ten tooth jump up. Um, so yeah, there's yeah, it's certainly aimed at a, at an entry level market, but. It looks good, and I mean, at that price, like you can really convince people if they come in with an old eight-speed bike that might have a flogged-out, you know, drivetrain that needs a new crank, that needs a new cassette, that needs a new chain. That maybe for this amount of money, they should just go ahead and 
make their bike a one by. Well, and the other thing you mentioned earlier about how, um, you know, Shimano's got all of these, like, you know, decades of bikes out there with these compatible parts, um, mm-hmm. and how this segment of the market really, even though the individual components aren't that expensive, it's, it's a big portion of their business, I'm sure, in, in total. Um, the other thing to consider is that for a lot of people, that level of bike that entry level portion of the of the market is is going to be the first time they have some sort of contact with a, with their component brand, right? Be it mm-hmm. Shimano, Sorry, and whatever. Um, and I think there's there's sort of like a, a mental piece to this because I feel like if you have a good experience with that component brand, if nothing else, it's a brand that you're familiar with with that first or second bike that you bought. I feel like more people are going to be inclined to kind of stick with what they. At, something that they at least seem like they're familiar with yep. instead of hopping to a different brand. Um, and what I also find kind of interesting is that at this end of the market, it, it's it's still kind of astonishing to me how good Shimano manages to make this stuff. I mean, yes, it's like heavier and you know it's missing some features of its nicer stuff, whatever, but it works so well and it doesn't feel crappy. Yeah, yeah. And I think... You know, the elephant in the room here is that tram historically at its very, very cheapest and most entry level levels has created some crappy components. Uh, and that's actually not a market they actively play in at the moment. Like the, the cheapest thing they've got at the moment that you actively, you know, that you see spec'd regularly is what Eagle SX is it. Uh, and at that level, I would rather have a Shimano group set. Uh, the equivalent Shimano, or I'd even have rather have a MicroShift because that SX stuff is pretty plasticky. And it's pretty cheap. It doesn't really have the accuracy required for you know tolerances of twelve speed. Uh, whereas this stuff, you know, it's eight speed. It's going to be robust. It's not going to be. It's not going to need precise adjustment because the gaps between each cog are, are pretty wide. So it's just a very sensible product at a low at a low range a low price point and uh yeah i mean shimano as you say are very dominant in it and it seems like shram has purposefully left this space at this point in time yeah which is which is curious because you'd have to think that i mean unless there really isn't as much money in that space as we're assuming there is maybe. but the other the other possibility is that you know maybe sram just made the decision that if they are having that much of a hard time competing with sram or competing with Shimano in that space, then yeah. they're just going to pivot and move to, to the high end and concentrate there, which seems to be what they're doing. Yeah. Um, it, it does remind me of an old article that uh, NSMB published, um, mountain bike website out of Canada, which uh, <laughs> I can't remember the author, but it was uh, basically suggesting that every product manager should be forced to ride their cheapest product they create. And it's like doing that would ensure that every every entry level or every new cyclist would have a good experience on the bike. Uh, and he was calling out Tram SX specifically within that article. But uh, yeah, that stands out to me. That's a, a memorable quote, but it's uh, I, I think there's a lot of truth to it. And you know, I look at this new Essa stuff, and you know, while it's not stuff I'd truly dream of riding, I, I think I'd actually be quite happy with it. In a sense, yeah. Like I am, I just it wrapped up. Stop me from a, riding. Yeah, for sure. I I just wrapped up it, my review of that Trek Marlin. Uh, I know mm. I had referenced this in an earlier show at some point. Um, I think that'll probably we'll probably publish that next week. I think after the classics classics are all wrapped up. Um, and yeah, that bike is just under a thousand US, and it came with a ten speed Shimano Dior drivetrain. Mm-hmm. Um, and I mean, yeah, the bike was heavy, fine. But the drivetrain was actually it was it was pretty awesome. Like the shifting was so good, mm-hmm. and it just works really really well. And it, like again, it just doesn't feel cheap. Like when you're looking at a bike that is a thousand dollars that has a drivetrain that in a lot of ways feels like a bike that is multiple times that figure, then that's pretty yeah. impressive. Yeah, absolutely. Um, the the other thing that struck me or that, that stood out to me about this press release is this Q's short reach shifter that Shimano mentioned. So. Mm. Um, I mean, if if I'm remembering correctly, Shimano hasn't done an exclusively push push flat bar shifter since the original rapid fire stuff in the late 1980s. Um, and huh. and granted, I mean, it, it's it's how a lot of people I know, myself included, um, actually use Shimano's current high end mechanical mountain bike shifters, which you know give you the option of either a pull or push for the for the yep. cable release. Um, but given how 
and again, I, I haven't had this Q shifter in my hand, so it's hard for me to say exactly, but from what I gather, yeah, it's a short reach shifter. It seems like there's minimal thumb movement required to actuate a shift in either direction. Um, it seems like it's one shift per push, one shift per push, which I'm sure, given the, the level of component that we're talking about here, but it does make me wonder if this might be a preview of something to come at the higher end from Shimano sooner than later, because I kind of like the idea of sort of like a short reach push, push mountain bike shifter from Shimano, if they can do it maybe with like two shifts per push at least. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I mean, it makes sense. And I guess where this is coming from is it's, it seems like it's specifically designed, the short reach is specifically designed around riders with smaller hands. Yes. Uh, so, you know, I, I'd imagine smarts, uh, product managers might spec this on like the extra small and small sizes of their bikes and then maybe the other more regular shifter on larger sizes from there. Maybe, but I mean, yeah, the, the short reach thing is obviously very specific to this, but, but what I'm really interested in is how those two, the, how those two levers are positioned much closer to each other than it, it, than they are currently with uh, Shimano's current mountain bike shifters. Yeah. Um, okay. Yeah. So, because what that honestly reminds me of was the older Shimano XTR Di2 shifter, which I mm -hmm. still think yeah, ergonomically say, is one of yeah, the best too. ones yeah. I used. Yeah, yeah. And for me, that's that's exactly where my mind was going. Is they kind of have had these ergonomics. It's just been in a a niche application of their Di2 group set. So yeah, it's, uh, yeah. I mean, uh, I'm sure. I, I think there's there's probably is merit to to this, and I, I'm sure they've they've extensively done their ergonomics research on it and. Who knows? Maybe we'll see it trickle over. Hmm. Well, I guess we'll keep our eyes on that one. Mm. Um, all right. Well, next up on our news, we've got, uh, we've known since Campagnolo announced its new super record wireless stuff last May that the company was working on some kind of crank-based power meter because it had like a little pocket molded into the back of the arms. Uh, and now, nearly a year later, we finally have it. Well, like not actually in our hands or anything, but Campagnolo has now confirmed that it exists. So they're calling this thing the HPPM, or High Precision Power Measurement Power Meter. Uh, it's a chain ring spider-based system with 16 strain gauges. Uh, Campagnolo would say, says that it... 16, yeah, it's a lot. Wow, okay. Yeah, so, so it's an unusually high number of strain gauges, but it also uh, supposedly uh, sends data at an unusually high rate, so 200 hertz. So it's sending 200 pieces of data per second as opposed to... Uh, what's more typical would like, I don't know, it, it, it's a small fraction of that. Let's just say that. Um, and Campagnolo is saying that it has, quote, exceptional data interpretation in real time, as well as detailed analysis after an activity, unquote. Hmm. Um, so given that it's a super record level product, it also features molded carbon fiber crank arm, titanium ultra torque two-piece two spindle, uh, and it's so, so not remotely inexpensive at uh, about 24.50 US or 22.40 euros. Sorry, I don't have pricing in pounds or Australian dollars. Uh, claimed runtime is over a month, whatever that means, uh, and there's a four hour recharge was, time. Yeah, I think it was based on about 500K use a week. Yeah, something like that. I mean, I can't remember what their what their estimate was, but anyway, um, and there's a supposedly a four hour recharge time with the same charge cable as the rest of the group set. Three crank arm lengths, you know, three different chain ring sizes. Uh, that all said, this is the sort of thing that I feel like Campagnolo needs to separate itself from the herd since Super Record Wireless has kind of gotten a bit of a lukewarm reception so far. But yeah, um, I wouldn't. I, I, really I wouldn't say if, to separate them. I'd say they need it to stay relevant. Sure, sure. Maybe I'm giving them a little too much credit there. Um, yeah. But what I'm wondering right now is if this is enough, because on the surface, that 200 hertz data rate is really interesting if you want to get super, super granular with your power data. Mm. Um, but the problem there is that unless you're using a separate device to capture all that data, most head units only record data in one second bursts. Sure. Um, so I don't really know who's going to be able to use this in the way that it is potentially, you know, offering some sort of advantage. Yeah, I I don't think many people buying power meters are are using those sort of advanced features. I mean, those sort of advanced features have been around for quite a while now. Like you know, Pioneer used to have something similar from memory, uh, where if you use their head unit or if you linked it to a phone, you could you could get that higher um, data rate, but. Yeah, I don't know. Maybe I'm 
maybe I'm talking out of turn there, but I, I don't believe, my, you know, I look at most people's head units and they have it set to three second watt average on, on power reading. So I don't imagine too many people are caring to that level, but hey, it's a feature that's there. And so maybe some people will use it. But uh, for me, if it proves accurate, uh, then I think it's enough in that it's a matching crank to the wireless group set. So anyone that is already buying that wireless group set, this is probably going to be an attractive upgrade for that. Uh, but or I maybe still, what they were waiting for to pull the trigger. Perhaps, yeah. But I still, I still don't think this is going to cause any significant rush towards that Campagnolo wireless group set, unfortunately for yeah. Campy. Uh, I agree. I, also, I was also a little bit disappointed to see that the shortest length they're offering with this is a 170 mil. And I think yeah. the trend is pretty clear there at the moment that uh, shorter cranks are pretty popular at the moment, and especially the sort of person buying this sort of group set. Uh, I suspect there's probably going to be a, a decent chunk of those that are interested in a shorter 165 crank. Yeah, that definitely that definitely struck me as a big miss there. Um, <clears throat> like one of the one of the biggest topics that we've seen on our own Escape Collective Discord boards is a lot of discussion about shorter cranks, and mm -hmm. there are an awful lot of our of our members who have been experimenting with them. Yeah, a lot of them are, you know, looking. They, they've bought um, kind of reasonably higher end like aluminum cranks off of like AliExpress and stuff like that, just because there hasn't been a whole lot of selection from the mainstream brands yet. Um, but it is definitely a fitting trend that we've picked up on um and you know campagnolo is another brand that just doesn't seem to have picked up on that just yet um, yeah yeah so, and even just like offering just you know being down to 170 by itself like that's that's just not that short anymore no correct that's that's the point right like it's sort of it feels like a 165 is now a required option within a high-end road crank uh so yeah. Anyway, I, I think this product looks nice. It, it adds about seventy grams over the regular super record cranks. It's not a significant weight gain given all the tech that's in there. Um, time will tell if it proves accurate. If it proves to be as as accurate as they claim, which is you know a, the one percent number. Uh, but yeah. Anyway, I think it it looks nice, but it. It's not. Uh, it's not something I'm running out to to spend my two and a half thousand US dollars on. <laughs> well, yeah, because you get like pliers and stuff to buy. Um, <laughs> exactly, exactly. Think uh, about all the Canipex I can buy for that. <laughs> That's like two pliers, Dave. <laughs> um, moving on to some industry news, uh, Dave. What the heck is going on over at Scott Sports? That's a good question, James. It's a very, very good question. I'm I'm not even sure people within Scott Sports are fully aware, uh, judging by what I'm reading. But uh, but yeah, I mean, that's their board of directors uh, gave notice to the long-serving CEO uh, Bayet Zag, uh, based in Switzerland, and basically this all comes off the back of a Korean company, sporting goods company. Uh, Young Gun uh, is the majority shareholder of Scott Sports, and uh, yeah, they they have basically made the decision to to release Alg of his of his responsibilities. And where it gets kind of fun is that uh, Zog kind of just turned around and publicly said, "No, nope, I'm not leaving." <laughs> um, so it's uh, apparently they didn't dismiss him in the right ways, and he's effectively refusing to go from what was his company you know he he at some point apparently owned as much as 100 percent of the of scott sports uh and these days yeah he, uh, he owns less than uh controlling shares so yeah it's it's interesting uh young gun seems to be making some pretty big moves and you know they recently gave a new cash in injection or or a loan to the company uh, to get them out of their overstocking issues, like every other company. Um, but yeah, it doesn't it doesn't look like it's the the prettiest of events happening at Scott Sports right now. I mean, not to not to make light of what is clearly a pretty serious situation, but I have this image in my head of you know Zog getting this email or whatever in in his in his inbox and him just sort of like duct taping himself to his chair and just being like, "No, make me." <laughs> yeah. Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> That's the vibe I'm getting. It's just, uh, and the fact that it's, yeah, it's being reported and it's, uh, it's in the public domain of, of, you know, both sides basically being like, no, he's fired. And, and, uh, Zalg being like, no, 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 I'm not. Um, it's, it's unusual to see that. I mean, do we have any indication of why they wanted to get rid of him? Uh, 
I don't. I mean, you can only assume that they believe uh, that it has been mismanagement through uh, through this time, and that they're you know overstocked and sales are down, and that they they feel that new action needs to be taken. But that's my guess. Uh, I don't know. Uh, I really don't know. But uh, who knows? Maybe he's been resistant to their to their requests and. They want, you know, maybe they've asked specific things that haven't been actioned and at some point, you know, the controlling side of the company is going to take that action if they're not getting their way. Hmm. So, but either way, it's, yeah. It's messy. Interesting it sounds and, very, uh, very messy. Yeah, a bit of turmoil at Scott Sport. <clears throat> so hopefully that resolves itself soon. Yeah, and hopefully it gets resolved in uh, some sort of reasonable fashion that doesn't have huge impacts on, I guess, people and the company. Uh, yeah, yeah, and not not to poke too much light at it, but there was a comment on Pink Bike that <laughs> made me chuckle, uh, which said, "Ironically, this is the type of stuff Scott should have focused on keeping internal." <laughs> that was. Uh, for for those of you who maybe n- didn't catch that joke, that's a that's a reference to Scott's insistent insistence on running all their cable internal through the headset. Yeah, yeah, there were there've been a at least a, an, an early mover in that in the mountain bike space, so it makes sense. Uh, that comment is is quite funny. <laughs> Ouch! All right. <laughs> Um, getting back to the gear side of things, one last thing I want to talk about in the new segment. Um, I know we have been revisiting over and over again this whole hookless road wheel and tire thing a lot over the last few weeks. Uh, I'm not going to beat that dead horse by dwelling on that yet again, but uh, I did want to mention that I've noticed some brands that only offer hooked road wheels. Uh, they're starting to capitalize a little bit on the situation with a little tongue-in-cheek, I told you so commentary. Um, so the first thing I saw was a few weeks ago, Andy Tetmeyer from Head, uh, he posted something on the company's Instagram feed about their Vanqu- their Vanquish road wheels. Uh, and, you know, it kind of, it seemed pretty normal at first going through the features and how they're made and aero and stuff like that. Uh, except he kind of coyly whispered at the end of the clip, we have hooks with mm. a little kind of like devilish grin on his face, which I thought was pretty cheeky. Um, and then more recently, Logos, uh, it's a brand that you probably haven't heard of, but it's an I offshoot haven't. wheel. Yeah, well, it's the offshoot wheel brand from the folks at Consumer Direct Bike Company Thesis. Um, mm. So they announced a trade-in program where they'll knock off up to $600 US from a pair of their wheels, which are hooked, uh, if you're willing to give up your current hookless setup. So I unfortunately wasn't able to get a whole lot of a uh, whole lot more information on this program before we had to record. But uh, regardless of the details, it seems pretty clear that some brands that have been resisting the hookless trend on the road are maybe kind of now circling like vultures a little bit. Mm. I, I would like to know what they're doing with said hookless wheels once they get them back. That was one of the questions I sent to them mm. and just unfortunately haven't heard back. Yeah, okay. But yes, I am I am curious about things like what they're going to do with those wheels and uh, how they are determining trade-in valuation and like are they going to wait until people actually send or until they until Logos receives these trade-in wheels before they send out the new ones, stuff like that. Because um, you'd have to think if they are – in the press release that they sent about this, they essentially made in no uncertain terms the idea that you know, they don't think hookless road wheels are – necessarily a pinnacle of safety, we should say. Mm. Um, and based on that, it would make sense then that they're not going to take these wheels and like donate them, donate them to some junior program or something. Like sure. I think, I think ostensibly what they are supposedly trying to do is get these things off the road and get wheels under people that they feel are kind of more confidence inspiring in terms of wheel, in terms of tire retention. Um, but yeah, lots of questions here. Uh, I mean, their wheels are, the Logos wheels are, I mean, they're pretty straightforward. Um, I don't know who's making their rims. Uh, the profiles look, I mean, they look pretty up to date. The The hubs are kind of knockoffs of DT Swiss Star Ratchet stuff. And I've had those hubs, whoever's making those, on a couple of different wheel sets now. And they're they're basically just DT Swiss Star Ratchet wheels. Um, so yeah, not really sure how, how good those wheels are. But either way, clearly there are companies who smell blood in the water. Mm. James, I feel like you're fear mongering by by uh, by repeating all this. 
There's nothing wrong with hookless as long as you know exactly what size tire to run at the exact pressure. You know your pressure gauge is right. You've got the right rim tape, the right sealant. You've installed it correctly without tire levers. You haven't left the bike in the sun. Uh, you haven't inflated your wheel in an air-conditioned room and then gone up into a hot <laughs> mountain. Uh, what am I forgetting? You haven't looked at them funny. You haven't, you know, you haven't, anyway, you haven't it's fine. You, you haven't said nice things to it that day. Um, <sighs> but yeah, I mean, it's fundamentally, I still will ride a hookless road setup and not be a fearful, fearful of it on a descent. But I also worry for the masses out there that don't work professionally as a tech editor and therefore know all the compatibility and limitations and installation requirements around it. Yep. Just Bingo. still doesn't strike me as a consumer friendly solution. Hmm. Well, we're going to leave. Ronan has taken it upon himself clearly to be the hookless road person mm -hmm. as far as taking point on this subject. So uh, I'd say at this point, we're going to leave that to him because you, you and I both know that this is not the end of the discussion with him. No. No. Anyway. All right. Well, let's uh let's take a quick break here. All right, Dave. Something I want to discuss today. Uh Crank Brothers recently announced a range of on-bike tools called SOS. It's kind mm. of more mountain bike oriented in SOS sound, uh, stands for Save Our Shred. Mm. Uh, five different setups in total that they have with various combinations of like multi-tools and tire levers, tire levers and tubeless plug kits, tube straps, CO2 cartridges, pump clips, whatever. Um, fit, we haven't physically had these in our hands yet. I mean, they look pretty good. Like I think they pack, seem to pack in an awful lot of things that someone would want to carry with them. Um, so Crank Brothers is definitely not the first to offer something like this. Um, you know, like Topeak and... Others have, I know, have come up with stuff like that. Uh, it's clearly a growing ecosystem, though, with more bike brands incorporating dedicated mounts for toolkits like this. And again, we're kind of talking more on the mountain bike side of things. Uh, what do you think of this trend? Uh, I really like it. So do um, I, actually. I, yeah. I, I, I think the the best of this trend is actually internal storage, uh, which is, you know, the frame hatches that specialize Santa Cruz... Who am I? Trek. Trek. A bunch of others uh, are offering, which basically is like a little hatch that sits underneath the bottle cage. And uh, typically they provide little store, um, organizer bags that sit within the frame. And uh, when done well, uh, you can make those systems rattle free and your spares stay hidden and clean. And I really like that. Um, but yeah, the, the downside of that is it adds weight. Or if you're riding an e-bike, your battery takes that spot. So... Well, and, that's and they can be a little bit. They can be a little more difficult to access when you really need them too. Yeah, that's true. So yeah, so I think yeah, having this stuff lower down on the bike is also uh, the next best thing. And for me, I still happily run saddlebags where a rigid seat post is used. But when you've got a dropper post, the extra weight of the saddlebag and just the movement of the saddlebag is just not. It's far from ideal. So, uh, well, and on and on some full suspension bikes, it, there's not really a whole lot of room between the top of the tire and the correct. back of the saddle when yep. you're at full compression. Yep, yep. As someone that has yeah lost a saddlebag through that, I I think that's <laughs> for that. So, uh, yeah, I think uh, yeah, on bike storage makes a huge amount of sense when you're talking off road applications, and it also helps to reduce the swing weight of the bike, which is basically you know the the top heavy weight that you have to swing side to side when you're riding out of the saddle uh so yeah i huge fan of it and uh on my mountain bikes i run like the the one up edc tool i have that in the in the steerer but you know even that's not perfect for everyone and it's nice to have options and i think yeah what crank brothers has done here by basically building it all into a bottle cage is, is quite smart well, I mean, that's just one of the options as far as the bottle cage, because, uh, because the, the mounting points that I'm talking about, we're seeing a lot more frames that have two threaded holes on the underside of the top tube, mm -hmm. kind of closer to the seat tube. Yep. Um, so yeah, this SOS kit, the bottle cage is one of the things that they offer, but most of them are toolkits that are designed to fit on those mounts. Yeah. Um, and I'm, I'm actually in the process, I think I'm, I'm kind of debating uh, moving on from my current trail bike and switching things up for a while because I've uh, kind of been on one brand for the last few years now. Um, and that's definitely, that is on my want list. So I think 
internal storage was probably like my ideal as far as putting like hiding stuff away as far as tools and stuff like that. Yeah. Um, but barring that, I definitely was looking for something with those sort of tool mounts. And uh, it, it's definitely a trend that I really like. I mean, I, I, I do like that brands are acknowledging the idea that, yes, bikes look super clean when they have like nothing attached to them and stuff like that. But, you know, it, it's nice to see them acknowledge that that's not the reality. Mm-hmm. Um so it's really nice to see that they are offering dedicated places to put this stuff and not only places to put this stuff, but like secure places to put this stuff where you don't really have to worry about the stuff falling off. Yeah, for sure. And I mean, fundamentally where all of this comes from is that uh, Camelback and other hydration packs have lost a whole lot of market share in re- in recent years because uh, a lot of people now just prefer using bottles. I mean, I've been I've been in this camp for more than a decade where I would prioritize bikes with bottle cages over not having bottle cages and not use a camelback unless it was an all-day adventure uh and then yeah i think we're just seeing uh obviously the masses are coming around to this where um bikes you know bottle cages are now a a must-have feature on bikes and uh as a result people don't want to carry a backpack full of you know ratley spares well yeah and i feel like for some people, they have been wearing hydration packs for so long that, I, that they almost don't remember what it feels like to not have one anymore. Mm. And I have to say, uh, I think my timeline timeline is pretty similar to yours in terms of how you know, how long do I stop wearing one. Um, but I got to say, when I stopped wearing one, it was like it, it was like this huge relief to mm. not have that on. A weight off your anymore. shoulders, some would say. Literally, yeah. Mm. How about that? Mm. Um, I mean, I still wear a hip pack, uh, and that's oftentimes where I carry my second bottle. Um, but even that, like that, that, that I don't find nearly as constraining as a hydration pack. Um, that all said, uh, I have tried the hydration packs from Usui, uh, Mm. over the last few months with that sort of X harness thing that they have. And I gotta say, like if they, if I had experienced that sooner, Mm. then I may not have ditched the hydration pack as soon as I did. Yeah. Because that harness, that harness setup is really, really good. Yeah. Those packs look really nice. Uh, on your frame mount idea with the, well, not idea, but on your frame mount wish list, as far as having those two bolts underneath the top tube, uh, minor pet peeve of mine is if you're going to mount, for me, if I'm mounting anything to that, I don't want it sitting wider than the top tube. Yes. And that is something that uh, some products on the market fail to do. Some products are, are too wide in that sense. So yeah, it really needs to retain a very narrow profile in order for me to actually want to use those mounts. Well, thankfully for me, what I'm going to end up doing if I end up going with this frame is I'm just going to switch to the inline mount for my one-up pump. Nice. And it definitely will be not, it definitely will not be wider than the frame. So yeah. And those one-up pumps are awesome. Like they, the pump so itself good. is fantastic. Uh, amazing volume, reliable easy to use but uh the big sealed well yep and uh but yeah the big feature is you can hide their whole multi-tool unit within the pump which is super clever so Mm -hmm. big uh, big fan mm. all right uh let's uh let's move on to this week's psa uh because i think this one's actually pretty good this one comes courtesy of escape collective member elizabeth c elizabeth i don't have your last name my apologies um but uh, but this was suggested by her, and it's a reminder to check your cleat bolts, which I think is a good one. Um, most of the time, you know, people install their cleats onto the bottom of their shoes, and then you kind of just like, just like sort of forget about them. You take them for granted. Like maybe you will occasionally check to see if your cleats are worn, but I don't really know of that many people who check to see that the bolts are still tight. Um, and granted, the more common issue I would say is that the bolts have been in there for so long and very likely installed dry that they're probably seized. Um, but they could also be too loose, which is definitely not uncommon at all. And that can lead to your cleat rotating on the shoe uh, and you being unable to get unattached from your bike, which makes for very, very awkward Instagram posts by your friends as they watch you sort of like awkwardly laying on the ground and trying to get off of your bicycle. <laughs> You speaking from experience? I am not speaking from experience. Are you speaking but if from the experience is someone laughing at the side of the trail while taking photos of your of your friend struggling to get out of a bush? Uh, no, because that's but the experience of, I come out from. <laughs> no, but if, if <laughs> but if one of my friends did did have that happen to them, I most likely would be pulling out my phone to take pictures of them, and then eventually I would help them get off of their bike. Um, eventually, but. 
I guess the reality is uh, that's probably not going to happen because most of the guys that I'd ride with uh, ride with flat pedals these days. So oh, that's probably not going to be an okay. issue for them. Yeah, right. Um, but either way, that is a good, it's a good tip because, again, it's something that most people take for granted and it is very, very challenging to deal with if they're loose. Um, I would, yeah, I would say uh, potentially consider some Loctite on them, some blue Loctite. Con- consider some Loctite. And I think another thing that people often misjudge is how tight they should be. Mm-hmm. Uh, I would almost say, especially for mountain bike cleats, um, because... On most mountain bike cleats, uh, the the side that goes up against the sole of the shoe is kind of toothed, yeah. and those teeth really do kind of need to dig into that into that sole a little bit um, to keep from to keep from rotating, just because there's so little surface area. It's not it's not quite as big of a deal on the road because the cleat has so much more contact with the shoe. Um, but for mountain bike cleats, yeah, like it, I think a lot of people do tend to leave them a little bit looser than they should be. I mean, definitely check the torque specs that are that are recommended for those cleats, depending on which brand you run. Um, but uh, yeah, I, I'd say that more often than not, I'd say people leave them looser than tighter. Yeah, uh, I would. Yeah, those teeth they they will settle into the sole as well. They they dig in, so that's why when you install your cleats the next day, you should you should check that torque again. You should just double check because they will effectively loosen up a little bit uh and i think that's probably where a lot of people experience the the accidental loose cleat from is yeah that that torque is less the next day after you install them and then from there they'll they'll rattle loose so Mm -hmm. um small old school tip with this is uh this really probably only applies to mountain bike cleats but uh you used to be able to if you did lose a cleat bolt you used to be able to kind of get away with taking a assuming you have six bolt rotors and not center lock uh you used to be able to take a rotor bolt out and use that as a makeshift cleat bolt um it sort of would rub a little bit it wasn't ideal but you could often get away with it in in an emergency i don't know if you can do that anymore because i think the clearances have gotten so tight Mm, possible possible but uh i haven't tried Uh, i should try it but uh then again, I probably don't need to because I checked my cleat bolts. <laughs> uh, another handy tip, uh, and this is maybe more applicable to the road than mountain, but uh, when you do install cleats onto your shoes, and I guess this would apply even if you already have cleats on your shoes, <clears throat> I generally like to mark the outline of that cleat with a Sharpie, uh, mainly just because it makes it a whole lot easier to install new cleats later because then you don't have to guess where that cleat used to be. Yep. I use a, what do they call it, a Tipex pen? Uh, a white marker because normally the sole's black so the sharpies yeah hard to see so um, Hmm. yeah anyway same uh, same tip different tool (laughs) Uh, speaking of sharpies one thing that people may not know is uh, sharpie does wipe off with rubbing alcohol or a variety of solvents and stuff sharpie does however make uh, a range of markers that are specifically solvent resistant so if you want to mark something and you really, really don't want that mark to go away, look for these solvent-resistant Sharpies. Pretty handy to have around, but also pretty handy or also pretty important to make sure that you don't confuse the two uh, Yeah, because that could end poorly. And and if you have someone in the house or a friend or similar that is likely to misuse said Sharpie in places you don't want it's, it. Uh, it's not, it's not a good not, thing to have in a yeah, fraternity house. Yeah. Yeah, or to have access uh, to have you know kids have access to. So yeah, weird. They don't they don't make like a like a rainbow assortment of these solvent resistant markers that are mm-hmm. typically available in in like you know big box stores and that sort of thing. Yeah. So. <laughs> All right. Well, let's uh let's wrap up this week's show with a few little few little bits of quick news here. Uh, Renee Hurst has a new range of polyurethane inner tubes that they are saying that are better than the other ones out there because they use all metal valve stems because uh, the plastic valve stems that you find on a lot of thermal plastic uh, thermal polyurethane <laughs> because a lot of the plastic valve stems that you find in a lot of those polyurethane tubes are known to be an issue uh, so these tubes from Rene Harris are supposedly made in Germany with slightly thicker walls for better reliability they're saying still pretty light they're pr- uh, supposedly 32 grams depending on the size uh, offered a bunch of widths in 700C and 650B diameters for about 30 bucks each US. Uh, speaking of tire brands, Vittoria's got a new range of products, although they're actually not for 
bicycles. Uh, much as we've seen from Continental Michelin, Vittoria is now doing treads for running shoes, in this case for the Swedish brand Kraft Sportswear. Tread design supposedly based on Vittoria's Terreno Dry with quote, thick and thin flex grooves to enhance traction and strategically placed cutouts to reduce weight, promising discerning runners unmatched performance across diverse terrains and changing weather conditions, unquote. Uh, I have no idea what these cost, but the running shoes look pretty neat. So uh, I don't really run though, because I would rather run my bike. They're, um, they're tubeless, right? Ah, uh, you know, they didn't specify. It also doesn't know if, I also don't know if they come with sealant. Mm. Yeah, okay. All right. We also don't know if they're compatible with hookless. Got to make sure the socks are compatible. Mm. I'd hope I'd hope your feet are hookless. <laughs> um, on the clothing front, uh, many geek warning listeners out there might be familiar with the Gorewear brand. Uh, like me, you might have been a little underwhelmed with what they've had to offer to date, uh, aside from their outerwear, though, which has been consistently pretty awesome. Uh, the company, however, is trying to up their game with a new collection called Spin Shift that Gore says is intended to go head-to-head with brands like Rafa, Asos, and Velaccio. Uh, big aspirations indeed. Uh I just, recu- I just received a couple of test pieces, I should say. Uh, and actually, it is noticeably better than what they've had in the past, at least for the stuff that I've gotten. Uh, definitely better tailoring, nicer feeling fabrics, uh, much more refined styling. So uh, it does seem like they are stepping things up in a good way. So stay tuned there. It's nice to see that that brand might be finally finding their way, I should say. It's been a while. It has been. I mean, the, the thing is, the brand has been around for a really, really I feel long like they've time. They've had a number of cracks at it, so it'll be interesting to see how they go again. Indeed, uh, and I feel like if this was any other clothing brand, that they would have given up a long time ago. But you know, this has the backing of Gore, which is not yeah. exactly a small company. Yeah. Um, so hopefully they'll figure it out, and it seems like they might be getting there. Uh, finally, Envy's got a new road tire called the SES Race Day, made with a double-ply 200 TPI nylon casing, thinner tread cap, and pretty much no additional puncture protection. Uh, Envy says, however, these are more than 8 watts more efficient in terms of rolling resistance and up to 75 grams lighter than their regular SES road tire, and that's per tire. Um, and... Uh, as you'd expect, there's a big trade-off in durability. Uh, again, pretty thin tread cap, no extra puncture protection. Uh, Envy says that it's all pretty typical for what you'd expect for like TT level tires, and like you've, we've seen those from Conti and Vittori and stuff like that. Uh, I did ask Envy's VP of Product and Brand, Jake Pantone, about sort of you know kind of like a honest take on what these are like in terms of ability, uh, and he told me these tires are quote like crack unquote, given how fast they apparently feel. Uh, But even he admits that he's only really managed to get about 750 miles out of a set at best and as few as 20, depending on conditions. Um, But apparently they feel really fast. Uh, You got them, you're offered in 27 and 29 mil widths. That's very important that they're not 26 and 28. Mm. Pretty strategic. Uh, They're as light as 195 grams per piece for the smaller size and they retail for 100 bucks US. So Mm. interesting. Okay. Uh, On the topic of race fast race tires uh hutchison are back with uh the blackbird which is a new road race tire that they've just released uh obviously claiming to be faster than previous and it looks like they're trying to come back and and be uh you know have a a relevant tubeless tire in that performance road market uh which makes me question and and ask you the the question james uh would you put them in the top five of brands you think of when shopping for tires these days? Hutchinson, unfortunately, I would say is a brand that really does seem to have lost its luster uh, for the last several years. Mm. Um, It's interesting because they were a super early pioneer in terms of tubeless road tires. They were were the partner with Shimano. God, it was like the late 2000s, like 2008 or whatever. Um, And like, they just haven't really seem to have figured out like just they just haven't really found their way mm. um and i actually wonder I, I believe they are the manufacturing partner for zip tires at least they were for quite a long mm. while they were for pirelli and for um, mavic as well once upon a time and i actually wonder if there are more tires under other labels that they've manufactured for mm. than tires that actually say hutchinson on them for sure yeah um because yeah they just doesn't they they 
yeah, they're just like, eh, no, would mm. they be my top five? I don't think so. Yeah. So um, anyway, so yeah, would, I think would it be, mm. yeah, would it be nice to kind of see them figure things out? Sure. Yeah. I'd say so. Yeah. So yeah, it seems like they've invested a whole lot into this new tire. And I think, yeah, time will tell how, you know, they're claiming it's vastly more durable than the Fusion 5 that came before it. It's faster. It's more puncture resistant. You know, they're, they're making all the right claims, but we'll see, you know, time will tell how, how fast this tire actually is and, and whether it's, you know, fast enough to compete with the likes of Vittoria and Continental who are really quite dominant at the moment in this space. Uh, are Blackbirds fast? I don't know. I don't know what yeah, a I don't know either. Is. Like, I, I, I guess I would have figured that they would maybe name it after like a, a bird that's known to be faster, like a, I don't know, like a, I guess Peregrine fal- Falcon doesn't really fit very well in the Hot Stamp or Osprey or something. I don't know. Mm, I feel like some of these trademarks are already taken. Mm, so, could be, could be. Uh, <laughs> one more, one more bit of uh, tech news, which is uh, Feedback Sports uh, celebrating their twentieth anniversary. 20 years uh, under the Feedback Sports brand, if I'm not mistaken, because the the products pre-existed that, which would would have been under the Ultimate Support name, which are you know a company that still exists, but in the in sort of the music stand world, you know they hold speakers and sort of that sort of thing. Uh, but yeah, Feedback Sports, 20 years, and uh, to celebrate, they have a gold work stand. So it's it's basically not not, not like actual gold. Are you sure? Oh, that's a good question. It would it would be really cool if it was gold plated. It would be. Uh, yeah. So I mean, it, it kind of looks like a bit like Fox Kashima in terms of colors, but it's it's basically just the Pro Mechanic stand, which I have reviewed on Escape. Uh, but yeah, just in a, a limited edition colorway, and they they've made a thousand of them, and they look cool. So, uh, but yeah, twenty years, which makes me uh made me understand that the the stand I I uh, abuse and keep outside because I shouldn't, but I do. Uh, is more than 20 years old and still going and still hasn't had a single part replaced on it. So uh, needless to say, I think you and I are, are fans of this of their of their work stands for how amazingly reliable these products are. I wish I still had my old ultimate work stand set up. So yeah. an ultimate work stand was actually the very, very first thing I purchased at discount when I first started working at a bike shop. Mm. Bought the, bought the whole set, the the stand, the bag, the truing stand, the, the toolbox, the, bought the whole kit. Um, and I still have some pieces of it, but I gave the stand away to somebody. I can't remember who, and I really wish I still had it, just for, if only for nostalgic purposes. Yeah. Um, it, it is still remarkably good, and I have no doubt, like, I have another stand that's not that much newer than that, and like it just won't die. Yeah. Um, the stuff is remarkably, remarkably durable. It's almost like, I don't know. Like, could, could we say it's like the Chris King of bicycle repair stands or something? It's something like that. I mean, it's it's kind of like you know where people say they don't make they don't make things like they used to. Um, they they kind of still do when you're talking they work stands. Yeah, 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 yeah. These these things just yeah keep going. So yeah, mine yeah mine is of the ultimate brand. So there you go. It's more than twenty years old and still works like new, which is mm-hmm. crazy. You know, it's good to see that there is still good stuff out there. Uh, And actually, I have one last very small little bit of news before we wrap up. Uh, Robert Axel is a U.S. brand that, uh, just given the name, maybe not surprising to hear that they specialize in a variety of different through axles and through axle related accessories. Uh, They just announced a It's quite astonishing how many uh, SKUs they have. I, I did, I did visit their uh, facility last year and uh, yeah, wow. Lots and lots and lots of axles. Mm. Uh, let's just say the industry is making a good business case for them. Oh, yes, um, very much but, so. uh, but their latest product is not an axle. Uh, it's actually a fully machined aluminum uh, derailleur hanger for uh, SRAM's UDH standard. Mm. So uh, a lot of people may not realize that the actual SRAM UDH bit is a co-molded kind of composite and uh, aluminum thing. Uh, they're not terribly expensive. They work. Um, but if you want a nicer one, it's all aluminum. Robert Axel's got one. They're not the only ones on the market, like North Shore Billet and some other companies also offer one. But it's nice to see other options. These aren't very expensive. They're like 32 bucks US. Uh, and if it's like everything else that Robert Axel make, it's probably a pretty good product. Mm-hmm. So something to keep in mind, because I do know that uh, while the idea of UDH is nice, that you don't have to find... Well, you don't have to figure out which uh, which hanger fits onto your bike. 
SRAM hasn't always done a fantastic job of keeping those things in stock. So mm. if you can't find one, just keep in mind there are alternatives out there. Yeah. All right. Well, that'll do it for this week's episode of Geek Warning. Thanks, as always, for listening. If you're already a member of the Escape Collective, thanks for the support. Uh, and if not, though, you may have noticed that you not only didn't hear any ads on this show, but you didn't haven't ever seen any ads on our website either and that's because we are a 100 member funded operation so members get full access to all of that awesome content as well as all the full versions of our exclusive members only podcasts such as ronin's performance process show and special deep dive episodes of geek warning uh dave you've also got your own tools and workshop focused newsletter called threaded and while that one's free you still want to sign up so you can get it delivered straight into your inbox every couple weeks and if you're not a member, it is a super quick and easy process. It doesn't actually cost that much either. Just head over to escapecollective.com slash join, enter a few bits of information, and you're in. If you've been enjoying what you've been bringing to you since we launched last March, but you still haven't become a member, what are you waiting for? Like, hey, you, Tom, Tom, yeah, you, Tom, your number's up. So quit being like that annoying kid that you knew in college who always somehow managedly managed to disappear whenever the bill came due at group dinners. You're growing up now. Act like it. All right. With that. I feel like that always. was coming from a very personal level, James. <laughs> <laughs> Are you still in contact with Tom? Has he bought uh, your lunch since? You know, I have had experiences like that, but not with someone named Tom. There have okay. been other people who I've experienced. Let's just say there is one friend of mine who I somehow ended up paying for like multiple meals for. Mm. And like this was well, well, well after college. Mm. So, yeah, yeah. Anyway, yeah. Tom, you're growing up. All right, with that, thanks as always for listening. We'll see you next week for another episode of Geek Warning. Cheers. Cheers.